I'm introducing uh, Saviv Raviv, that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, six, six, years, six years of practice to get you it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, he was born before the Israel was actually considered a city. And, um, say to <laughs> country, oh, my fault. But, um, well, at the age of 13, he went to Mexico, then he came back, did his time in the army, then he went to the University of, um, is he, what's the University of here? Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, and then he started a campaign to release Soviet Jews from the Soviet Union who wouldn't be released, and he ended up releasing over 1.1 million Jews. Um, after that, he ended up working with the mayor of Jerusalem, and then after that, he retired. Man, here it comes. <laughs> Von, I must tell you, this is the first time that somebody introduces me and I don't find new things about myself. <laughs> you know, usually, you know, you give your CV and somebody starts talking to you and then they embellish this and embellish that, and I love it. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, he won the gold medal. No, he didn't. <laughs> Never mind, what do I know? Anyway, welcome to Jerusalem. Can I ask you, you're a singer too, right? No. Would you like to belt on a song for us real quick? No, 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 no. I run, I run a choir. So when I don't have my support system around, you know, it's uh, a bit difficult. But maybe at the end, you know. So we'll see, we'll see. The night is young. Anyway, uh, welcome to Jerusalem. Uh, who is here for the first time? Wow, I envy you. Thank you. I envy you because uh, until you came, Jerusalem was intangible. When you came, now you believe Jerusalem is tangible. But you don't realize that when you come here and you step on this square, most probably the people you heard of or you read about in the Bible stepped here too. I have to all the time tell myself King David was here. And I have to tell myself that King Solomon was here. And I have to tell myself that Jesus was here. And I have to tell myself that I live as part of the Bible. I live as part of the story. I am the story of today. I am the King David of today. I am the Jesus of today. I am a dweller of this city. I am born in this city that was just a village. 3,600 years ago, it was nothing, absolutely nothing. And then came King David and gave it importance. Now let's analyze it, what he did. In 1957, that's a bit after King David, <laughs> six countries in Europe decided to get together in Rome signing the first agreement that led to the European Union. What was the Jewish people? At first, there were 12 tribes. And these 12 tribes had an economic agreement. They had, they traced uh, the boundaries of the tribes all over, Judea was here, uh, then other, uh, Zvulun was in the north, and Menashe was half here and half there. And, you know, there were 12 tribes. There was a, a European economy, the United States of America. Alabama, California, Ohio. 
Okay? And then they decided to take somebody to be like the coordinator. Ah, you used to kill him king. And they took a shepherd. Saul was a shepherd. He didn't want to be a king. He became a king. He became a coordinator, etc., etc., but didn't do too much, so it's fine. Like today, you have in Europe. Do you know who is the president of the European Economic Community? Nobody does. Okay? So suddenly, a guy who was the hero of his time became the king. And you know, the tribes were divided into the kingdom of the south called Yehuda or Judea and the kingdom of the north called Israel. The capital was in a place called what today is Shechem, Nablus. That's all the capital. And the people of the north said, you're not our king. You live in the south. And King David said, what, a, what, what do you mean? But I was elected. I am the king. They said, you live in the south. He said, but if I go to the north, then the people of the south will tell me you live in the north and you don't live in the south. So what should I do? He thought and established, came to Jerusalem and established D.C., which is not the district of Columbia, but it's based on the same principle, David City. This, the name of this city is the David City, is the city of David. We know it. The Arabs know it. You know, we have a tower here in Jerusalem called the Tower of David. Between us, it's a minaret from the 16th century. It's Muslim. What does it have to do with, tower, with David, with King David? Absolutely nothing. So why is it called the Tower of David? Because the Muslims used to call this city Balad al Daud, city of David. City of David and the tourists that came from Alabama and Ohio and California, etc., like you, went back to their countries and they asked, what's new in the city of David? And they said, ah, there is a tower in the city of David. There is a new tower in the city of David. This is how the name became. Like, you know, you write Knight, N-I-T-E. Right? So instead of Tower of the City of David, they said the Tower of David. And suddenly it's a Tower of David. But let's go back to, our, to the situation. Now, the problem about 2,700 years ago was that we started a real estate venture here in Jerusalem called the temple. And suddenly, there are no idols in the temple. No clay figures that we worship. We don't have to sacrifice humans like the Aztecs until the 15th century, 500 years ago. That used to slaughter the young in order to nurture the sun because the sun is the one that controls everything. We invented something new. It's called a monotheistic religion. And where is our God? Somewhere. And here's a book. And the book is a history book. But the book has something else. The book has the moral code of the world, how to behave, what to do, man and wife, family, 
people with animals, people with the soil. You should cultivate it for six years, let it rest the seventh year, because otherwise she will not give fruit on the eighth and ninth and tenth year. So it's a code, it's a moral code. And everybody wants it. Then came another, now well, he wasn't the king, although he called himself king, King Herod. He was a governor. He was appointed by the, the Romans that controlled this area. They took him because he wasn't Jewish by birth. He was a, his father converted to Judaism. And he said, Solomon built a temple. It was a soil. Now you'll see what I'll do. And instead of a temple, which was already the most magnificent structure in the world at that time. By the way, when I talk about the world, nobody knew that China existed or India. When I talk about the world, I'm talking about the world around the Mediterranean. Nobody knew that there is an American continent. You know, today, we think we know, and suddenly, uh, you know, today I saw a program on, on, on British television about fish that are too frail to be in the water, so they live on rocks outside the water. They try to wash themselves because they breathe through their skin, but they don't go into the water. Because if you go into the water, the predators are going to eat them. So, but basically we know what's going on. Then, I'm talking about 2,000 years ago, nobody knew. You knew, what did you know? The Mediterranean. That's what you knew. You knew that there was Greece, you knew there was Egypt, you knew there was just a coastline. Basically, you didn't even go into the mountains. When Hannibal came through the mountains to take over, ooh, this was the whole the books and films about it. But at that time, nobody was there. So anyway, Herod, instead of building what uh, King Solomon built, he decided to take it, to take a real project. So he took the mountain and built around the mountain a plateau 500 meters long, 270 meters wide. And this is the Temple Mount. And he built a temple. But then he built the royal portico. That's where the Supreme Court of the Jewish people was, called the Sanhedrin. They are the ones who are able to change the rules, the same rules that are in the Bible. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it, I'm trying to develop a longer kind of trajectory because I understand that you being here and being with Mike, you know what I'm talking about because you know your Bible. But I want to put it into the modern context because we live in 2018 in a modern world. And we have to understand that 50% of humanity, and again, I'm talking about the Judeo-Christian Muslim world. I'm not talking about the Eastern religions because that's a totally different, totally different opera. Totally different story. They don't even know what we're talking about. The Jewish, Christian, and basically the Muslim world adopted the rules of behavior of the Bible. Oh yes, the Muslims wanted to change a bit, and they changed it, and I can tell you the story about, about Muhammad, etc., but this is not the subject of today's, of today's talk. But basically, in the Quran, he accepts uh, 
uh, Moses, he accepts Jesus, he accepts uh, everything, but says, you know, they are a thing of the past, now I'm the new boy on the, on the, in the neighborhood, so believe in me. Why? Why should we believe in you if you depend on others? Why should we believe in you? Well, you should believe in me because I say so. And that's not good enough for people that understand that the most important thing are the values. The values of the Bible, the Jewish values adopted by Christianity, which I consider as a Jewish sect. Not only me. The Pope. John 23rd said that you are our big brothers. So, if we consider that based on the wide area of the behavior of people, now we have a common denominator and now we can talk about the situation of 2018. Because this is what binds us. Now, when King David came here, he established the Jewish people. Until he came here, there were 12 Jewish tribes. This is the common denominator of the Jewish people. And this is the common denominator of Christianity. Could Christianity live without the Bible? Could Christianity live without the Jewish people? It's symbiotic. You have to understand that in order to understand 2018, because if we don't understand that we work based on the same rules and regulations that were, you know, we have the Constitution, and you have 25 or 26 amendments, I forget. Okay? Well, the Bible doesn't get amended. It was reconstituted uh, 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 with the New Testament, but basically, if you go into Luke, you will see that he says, that Jesus said, don't divert from my religion. Am I correct, or I don't understand what I'm talking about? Good. So now let's talk 2018. We have two, we have two problems in Israel. Only two. Number one, and you know, uh, had I been with the Jewish crowd, somebody would have whispered, yes, too many Jews, too many opinions. What can we do? That's life. <laughs> Two. One, we, like the United States, which is another example, we brought people here from 116 countries. Now, in the United States, you say we brought people from 100 or 200 countries into the United States and gave them a common denominator called American. Whether they came from Tanganyika, they came from Canada, they came from Chile, they came from Europe, they're American. When we brought them for 160, 116 countries, they had a common denominator, but we had to rebuild it. Because if you go to a house of a Jew in a hundred years ago in Morocco, you see the candelabrum, you see the mezuzah on the door, just the mezuzah like from the Bible, Egypt, etc., to mark that this was a Jewish home. And you have the rituals. You have the same blessings on the wine, on Friday, you have the same things, etc. And when you go to Poland, you see the same. There is the same candelabra, 
there is the same candlesticks. Oh, yes, different. You go to the Israel Museum and you see a hundred different types of, 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 uh, of uh, candelabrum. Well, from different places. One is made of clay, and the other one of silver, and the one of metal, and the one of plastic, everything. The whole gamut. But we still had to create a common denominator here, even though they came with a common denominator. And now, 70 years after the establishment of the State of Israel, we are dealing with building that common denominator. And let me just give you a, a, a little bit about American history. Because it goes so parallel that you have to, you will be able to conceptualize what I'm saying. There was a philosopher in, in, in uh, Germany called Hegel. And Ah, it's in German. I think it's H-E-G-E-L. And if not, I failed. <laughs> Hegel wrote about the 80-year syndrome. And the 80-year syndrome is that 80 years after the revolution, Eight years after the revolution, the grandson doesn't have the foggiest idea what the grandfather wanted. What happens, after, uh, what happens eight years after the revolution? What happens? You have a civil war. Check your timing. Eight years after the American Revolution, there was a civil war. Now, people say that the civil war is about releasing the slaves. It's not true. The civil war started with one single question. The question was cessation. The southern states didn't want to stay in the Union. Not because of the slaves. In the last minute, in the seventh year, you know, they used the subject of the, the, the uh, freeing the slaves, etc., in order to try and compensate the black soldiers that fought with both the Union and the Confederacy. That's why the, the, the slaves were released. We don't understand it now. Why on earth should we have slaves? But that's besides the point. But 80 years after the revolution, people didn't understand why should we have the United States of America. And I'll give you another example of 80 years. 80 years after the Bolshevik revolution in Russia, the Soviet Union disintegrated. The biggest thing about the United States is that it managed to get over the 80-year syndrome and create a strong country and create the United States of America. This is a phenomenon in history. Take the Crusaders here in Jerusalem. The Crusaders came here, established the kingdom of Jerusalem, and disintegrated eight years later. They disappeared. In Mexico, I lived in Mexico for a few years, so I know Mexican history. Now, it took 90 years, not 80 years. Why? Because there was a Porfirio Diaz who was a dictator, so he didn't allow. But then, you know, you see Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, etc., etc. These were the revolutionaries. They had said, what on earth are we doing here? Israel is in the situation today. Israel doesn't have the choice of disintegrating. Israel doesn't have the choice of a civil war. Israel has only one choice. Pass this hurdle without the civil war. 
Yeah, there are discussions here, and if you read the papers, the religious against the non-religious, the, those who came from Morocco against those who came from Poland, and this and that, and the, the whole thing that we're trying to sort out. But this is number one. Then we have another battle. You know, 70 years ago, it was easy to convince the world that we have the right to exist. Why? Because the world had a guilty conscience. American president wouldn't send planes in order to bomb the gas chambers and save Jews because it wasn't on his agenda. And the British, when they could do some did. They took some refugees that came, but most of the countries in Europe, you know, they talk about uh, Macedonia just became a country two days ago. Northern, the Northern Macedonia. You know, it was under the Bulgarian king, and they told the Bulgarian king, you have to send all the Jews to the gas chamber. They said, okay, take them. This was the whole thing. Europe was prepared to sacrifice Czechoslovakia and Austria and the Sudeten to Germany. So they said, the Jews, okay, yalla, no problem. But today, very few people know what the Holocaust is. How many of you read the newspapers every day? How many of you get your, get your information from your uh, iPhone? Okay. So, your iPhone, which means, uh, how is it? Uh, uh, 100 Twitter, 140 characters? So, we don't really know what's going on in the world. Me too. I read the paper every day. But sometimes I forget. I have other sources of information. Basically, Western civilization doesn't have the information. And you know what? We don't really care. I'm not talking about you. You're here. And because you're here, you care. And because you're here, you are not the example, but you are You're not the rule, but you are something special. That's because of this guy here, probably. But you have to understand, most people that you'll talk to, that you'll come across the United States, where were you? Why on earth did you go there? They are shooting people in the street. The place is burning. <laughs> I don't have to tell you. You got it before you came. Didn't you get it before you came? From your friends and family, etc. said, why don't you go to Acapulco instead? <laughs> am I right or am I wrong? So the second thing, and this is the last stage of our war of independence that started 70 years ago, 71 years ago, or 70 years ago in a, a few days. And by the way, when I came here last time, Mike showed me the painting downstairs that uh, I know if you told them that the Marines, Marines who were hiding here when my father was fighting outside, the Marines didn't have what to, what to do, so they painted the world and painted there where are the Marine forces of the United States in the world. Very interesting map. Very interesting map. Should be restored. Should be restored. And this is the importance of 
what happened a couple of weeks ago when President Trump officially moved the embassy of the United States to Jerusalem. And again, for me, the United States, listen, I was born here. I'm very proud of, of Israel. I'm very proud of Jerusalem, very proud of everything. But the United States is the guy that preserves civil society with all the faults. And believe me, I know the faults. I know all the faults of the United States. But without the United States, there wouldn't have been a Europe. Without the United States, there wouldn't have been a Latin America. Because the United States was lax, Europe is fading. The United States was the defender of the values that we share. The values that are the common denominator between you and me. And this is the second battle that we have today. So the first one is the last stage of the ingathering of the nations in Israel trying to coordinate, take the best of each diaspora, put it together, get a new, you want to have a social pact, social pact. You want to try and give it another term, another term. And number two is the recognition of the world. That's how I see Israel today. Now, going to another subject, and this will be the last, and then I'll open up for questions and answers, etc. Once you get a tool, it's in your hands what to do with it. We said all along that we need to return to our ancient land. The prayers always used to finish with next year in Jerusalem. And it wasn't the central bus station. It was the Temple Mount. Next year in Jerusalem. But then we said, we want to contribute to the world. Now again, you have to, un you, have, you, see, you see, we live in 2018, and you have to understand what happened. Until the end of the 18th century, a Jew in Europe couldn't own land, couldn't deal with any profession, except one thing, be a banker. Because the European, uh, princes or, or uh, estate uh, uh, owners, etc., used the Jew that couldn't have another profession as the tax collector. And they came at the beginning of the year and they said, listen, you have to collect taxes from, every, from everybody. And next year they came and said, you have to collect this year 20% more taxes. Because the prince wanted to live well because the king wanted to live well, because the head of the estate wanted to live well. But he didn't want to do the dirty job, so suddenly we became bankers. But we couldn't be dock workers. We couldn't be doctors. We couldn't do anything. So we invented something new called NGOs. NGOs that today run the United States and Western civilization is an invention of the Jewish world from the 12th century, before the United States was even a figment of uh, whatever. Because the Jews couldn't, weren't supplied with services that the state would supply to non-Jews, so they had to organize themselves and get it all together. 
You go to Prague and you see in Prague the evidences of the NGOs of the 12th and 13th centuries. It's fascinating. And that's how the Jewish world behaves. Then at the end of the 18th century, there was a guy by the name of Napoleon that said, look, you know, it's not logical that we have these guys that know how to read and write. Most people at the end of the 18th century didn't know how to read and write, except the Jews and the priests. The priests knew how to read and write, and the Jews. And they say, oh, we should emancipate them. And suddenly, within 100 years, in Europe, five out of 10 best people in each profession were Jewish. And people said, wait a second, the Jews are competing with me. Instead of me being there, you know, that we were told for hundreds of years the Jews are the lowest possible class. They were worse than slaves. Suddenly, there are five of the ten best doctors and five of the, pen, the, the ten best sculptors and five of the pen, ten best uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, painters, etc., etc. And if I give you the names, you'll see. And you say, wait a second, this is something that we don't understand what's going on here. They were the outcasts. They were the guys we wouldn't invite home and suddenly... started a whole wave of what we call modern anti-Semitism. You take a little bit of Catholicism, you inject it with a little bit of envy, and you've got the whole explosion. So suddenly, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, we were to blame for everything. The Tsar in Russia is killing his people, the Jews are to blame. The Austro-Hungarian Empire is crumbling, the Jews are to blame. We were blamed for volcano eruptions. We were blamed for everything until today. There is a document that was written by the uh, security services of the Russian Empire called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Total fabrication. There isn't such a thing. But there are about 250 editions in all languages in the world. For example, the bushfire in Chile is because the Jews are trying to control the world. There was a whole thing. There, was a, there are books written that the Jews want to establish another Jewish country in Chile. Why? Why go to Chile? <laughs> Why go to Chile? You know, I, you know, I've been around, I've been to Chile, I go elsewhere, not Chile. But anyway, it's, it's, the, it's the sensation that led us to believe that we need a country. And the only country that we need is here, because this is the country of my ancestors. And this is a country that never after me, with the exception of 80 years of the Crusader Kingdom, never had a self-government. When you're talking about the Palestinian people, you're talking about a term that was invented in 1966. And I'm not claiming that they don't have rights. I'm willing to I want to give them rights. That I'm willing. If they'll have rights, I'll have rights. Do I make myself clear? So we are talking about the acceptance, but we're talking about something that we had to prove. And let me just tell you, you know the Nobel Prizes. You know that we are totally insignificant in the world. I think we are 0.002% of humanity. We have 27 or 28% of all Nobel laureates. 
this country. This country has 12, and we are only 70 years old. We have 12 Nobel Prize winners. That's more of the entire Muslim world with 1.3 billion people. They have three. So we had to prove ourselves. So we prove ourselves in the field of agriculture. We make the desert bloom. When we came here, you, when, when the Jews came here 100 years ago, 120 years ago, you didn't see trees. Israel is the only country in the world that got into the 21st century with more trees than it came into the 20th century. You know why? Because the Turks that ruled here used to cut all the trees for fire logs, for heating in the winter. There were no trees. That's why the soil is very bad. Because the trees didn't disintegrate, they disintegrate, new soil, new soil didn't produce, didn't reproduce, etc., etc. So we had to prove ourselves. I remember, not I remember, because I, I read it. In 1948, the exports of Israel were oranges. Today, we export everything under the sun. And there are many things that you use that you don't know that were invented here. From your mobile phones, the X, the iPhone X was invented here. The ICQ or connecting the computers was invented here. Now we are developing the autonomous car with the Mobileye. You know what Mobileye is? When I drive and I cross the line, it starts beeping. When I nearly collide, it starts beeping, etc., etc. They are now turning it into, there are cars, autonomous cars, riding in this city right now. They chose Jerusalem because Jerusalem is hilly, so it goes up and down and this and that and that. There are autonomous cars here. And then medicine. Our doctors invented a camera that small that you ingest and you can look from the outside and see what's wrong with you so you can treat you. And you go field by field by field by field and in 70 years we became from that perspective a superpower. And imagine what would have happened had we had peace. Because we have to divert our energy to all kinds of things and all kinds of areas. You know, there is a group of Israeli kids who is prepared to send a satellite to the moon. We're going to be the third country to land on the moon. It's already ready. Okay? They are waiting. It was done with... We are flying kites in Gaza. Kites! Stupid kites! Imagine what we're doing! Imagine where we have, we have to divert our energy. You don't understand. I, and this is the final sentence I'm going to say before we... Uh, before you can ask any question you want. At the end of the Second World War, there was an American Secretary of State called George Marshall. And George Marshall said, rightly so, he said, Europe is destroyed. Europe was destroyed after the First World War and the ones who won the war demanded from Germany reparations and expenses, etc., that created the Second World War. And he said, I don't want anything. I want to give money to rebuild Europe. And in today's prices, America gave each European $65 to rebuild Europe. 
and Europe was rebuilt. Each Palestinian got until now $5,000, and their situation is no different than the situation that they had 70 years ago. No, it was worse. This 50% unemployment in Gaza. Because whenever international bodies give money, they take 50% and use it for digging tunnels, um, sending rockets, uh, buying uh, all kinds of arms, you know, to kill Israelis. And they have a chance to kill the state of Israel, like all of you have a chance to be Nigerian blonde beauty queens. The same chance. Because, you know, fortunately, we knew where to put our resources. We get low salaries, much lower than the United States. We get all kinds of things. There are all kinds of things. But we managed to, you know, all of you are starting your life. And you have to, in each segment of life you get to. You have to tell yourself what's more important to do now. <coughs> because life is an option. I do one, I do two. You go by one, and one is the right thing, and then you go A and B, and then you have to choose between uh, uh, C and X, etc. And you have to choose the options. We chose the right options. We chose 70 years ago <coughs> to establish a country that will serve the world. And we today are serving the world. Israeli inventions are helping people. Israeli inventions are curing people. Israeli inventions are opening the possibility of distance learning. Israeli inventions are opening the possibilities of going not only to the cities, but to the villages and the farms and this and that. And who understands it? The Chinese, the Indians, because they understand it. Unfortunately, the Europeans don't. Because the Europeans have After the Second World War, where Europe was racist and xenophobic, the European countries decided to be super extra liberal, and it's killing their countries, and not having children, by the way. They have, the Europeans have about 1.1 children per family to 1.6 children per family. So in 20 years or 30 years, that's why they're bringing all these immigrants, because they need somebody to work. They don't have children that work. There are no people, no people to work in Germany. There are no people to work in Sweden. There are no people to work in, in, in Belgium. So they're bringing immigrants. So before they used to bring workers from Morocco, from Turkey, etc until the gates were open and they all came, they're all coming in. Now I'm going to touch, I know that I said I'm going to end up, but I'm going to end up with something else. Because you're going back and you have to go back with a message. The most important problem of the Middle East is, what's the most important problem in the Middle East? Huh? War, sir. War? War, sir. Ah. He is absolutely right. Absolutely right. If you, so I, I didn't understand him because I didn't understand the accent, but that's besides the point. It's my, my problematic hearing, not him. If you look into the Middle East, the rivers of Babylon are dry. Why? Because Turkey put a dam in order to create, in order to flood the Kurds, in order to flood historic cities, 
as part of the war against the Kurds. But Iraq is suffering, and the Iraqis are leaving. I don't know what you know about the, world, about the situation in Syria, but you know how the civil war in Syria started? When 1.5 million villagers came to the cities because they didn't have water in the village. They couldn't grow anything. The same thing is happening today in Egypt because Ethiopia is putting a dam on the Nile in order to irrigate its own fields, but it's going to strangle Egypt, and Egypt has 100 million people. We solve the problem. Israel doesn't have water. You have been around. We have two lakes, one of them dead. <laughs> no? We have no rain for five years or six years. But we saw the problem that today exists in California. In California, people are, are, are starting to tell me, you know, don't use the water. Yes, use the water. Why don't you wash up only three times a week instead of every day, etc., etc. South Africa, Cape Town is, 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 is drying. We started with desalination projects 15 years ago. Today, most of the water that we have today running through our faucets is desalinated water. Most of the water running in the islands in the Mediterranean and the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and some in Saudi Arabia are because Israelis install desalination plants over there. Oh yes, they came with all kinds of contracts. Don't talk to this, don't talk to that. But anyway, we solve the water. We can solve, we can solve the problem. We can solve the problem of Gaza tomorrow. We can solve the problem of Lebanon. We can solve the problem of Syria. We are solving the problem of Jordan. We signed a peace treaty with, with Jordan by which we're going to give them 50, 000, or 50 million cubic meters of water. We're giving them 200 million because of the 1 million Syrian refugees that are today in Jordan. Now you have to go back to the United States. And you have to give the message to the people. We are creating now situations, making the desert bloom and giving life. And the people in the United States and the people elsewhere in the world have to understand that we are part of those who give life, not of part of those who disseminate death. I don't think that any of the terrorists that are shooting in the streets around the world, in Sydney and in Berlin and in the United States, etc., is Jewish. We spread life. By the way, you know what is the fertility or the, the birth rate in Israel? It's between 1.5 to 1.6 in Europe. In Israel, it's over three people per family. Over three people per family. You know, my oldest son has only two children, so I forced my youngest son to have four. <laughs> Just to go over that. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm open for any question you may have. Anybody who is a friend of Mike's is a friend of mine. So my question for you, when Bonnie introduced you, you talked about how you would help aid 1.1 million, uh, I guess, Israelis in the facility? No. 
when Israel was established, it was in 1948, uh, the guy who ruled the Soviet Union was a guy named Stalin. Now, Stalin was a bit of the dictator. And uh, the policy was the Iron Curtain, which means nobody leaves. <laughs> Simple as that. In 1968, as a result of the Six Days War, and the Russians or the Soviets that wanted the Arab world, because what can we do? There are 22 Arab countries and only one Jewish country. So they said, we'll go with the majority. So they, because of the Cold War, etc. They said, uh, to it, we had no relation. But they used to write in the papers and the paper, you know what is the name of the paper in Russia? Pravda. Pravda is the truth. So they say that we are terrorists and we are killing this and we are killing that, etc., etc. And the arch-terrorist of Israel won the war against three Arab countries. Now you have to understand that how do you write English from left to right? We write Hebrew from right to left, the opposite direction. So the Jews in Russia are starting to read Pravda from right to left. When they say they are arch-terrorists, they say, ah, they are probably nice people. And, and suddenly there was an awaken, awakening of the Jews, we want to come out. I learned about it with two other friends. And we decided to start a whole campaign in the world under the slogan of let my people go. So let my people go. We uh, started in Israel because first we had to convince the Israeli government. And the Israeli government said, we're afraid, don't worry, you know, they're going to kill the Jews, they're going to do this, they're going to, we are 24 years old, we said, we couldn't give it them and protested. So we get a call from the Prime Minister's office that says, if you will not cease to work for Soviet Jewry, you'll find yourself doing military reserve duty in Sinai for four months to cool off. Now, this was, it was a real threat. So when it came to me, I said, I couldn't care less. I want to meet with the Prime Minister. Within three days, we met with Golda Meir, who was the Prime Minister. And we met with her for about 20 minutes. And after 20 minutes, she said, uh, well, you know, and there we have this, we have that. Thank you very much for the message. Goodbye, etc." And she stood up and she lit up a cigarette. And I told her, Mrs. Meir, I want to tell you why I'm going to continue to protest against your government. I said, why? I said, because in 20 years' time, when my children will ask me, what did you do to save Soviet Jews? I will have an answer, contrary to my father's generation, when I ask, what did you do during the Holocaust? And she said, you don't know history. We sent paratroopers. I said, I'm a graduate of the history department of the Hebrew University. We sent 38 paratroopers for espionage purposes to Europe during, the, during the, the, the Second World War. She said, but we didn't have a country then. I said, now we do. And I saw how she was the Prime Minister of Israel, but she still thought her mindset was, we still don't have a country. She was afraid. And opposite of what's, what's happening today. Today, you tell my, my sons, you know, there was a time without a Jewish country. They said, ah, stop, you know, this is history. You know, forget about it. 
This was, Friday, this was Thursday. On Monday, my friend, Yona Yahav, the one who did it with me, who is now the mayor of the city of Haifa, get a call from the assistance of the prime minister. And he said, I'm happy to tell you that the government made the decision to start an all-out war against the Soviet Union in order to allow free immigration of Jews from the Soviet Union to Israel. And a few months later, there was an international conference about nine months later, the government established what's called the Conference for Soviet Jury or the, the, the organization. Anyway, we started the whole, uh, the Israeli government started to send uh, uh, people to Argentina and to uh, the United States and consuls and this and that in order to try and commotion around the world. And in 1969, there were 999 immigrant people that came. In 1970, no, sorry, 3,000 that came, 250 a month. In the year 70, 999, because the Soviets wanted to slow down and said, don't, we are not releasing. But then little by little, little by little, until in 1989, I believe that we had, we, together with Ronald, with, uh, with, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, brought down the Soviet Union. And by the way, we are the only ones that listened to Ronald Reagan. Americans didn't. Ronald Reagan had an idea of Star Wars, and we implemented it. All the missiles that you see that are shooting down missiles were invented because of Ronald Reagan. The American didn't listen to him. The European didn't listen to him. We were the only ones that listened to him. Okay? So the gates were open, and then we started having every night a jumbo and another jumbo and two jumbos, and suddenly within one month we had 30,000 new immigrants. And they used to, really used to come at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, and I used to go to the airport to see how they come. And they came, herds, people, etc. Every day used to come to Ben Gurion Airport where you came. And there were, once I came, it was December of 1989. There were stacks of packages that were much taller than I am. That they had to be released, but they didn't have enough manpower to release them. Because everybody came with uh, two, three, four, five, seven suitcases, etc. They weren't, they didn't have the 20 kilo limit. Okay, they brought their lives. And then came a woman and said, Mister, I'm a professor of biology. And these are seeds that I developed in the Soviet Union. I didn't want to leave them there. I want to bring them here. Then I saw what is my children's inheritance. This is my children's inheritance. This is what I did. Against, believe me, against all odds. This is what I did. And 1.1 million came here, and about half a million decided to go elsewhere. There are uh, Russian Jews in America, in Europe, in, in Australia, etc., etc. They'll come. Eventually they will. If they don't, their children will. Because we don't want to be a nomadic people anymore. We want to stay in the same place. Anybody else? Did I respond? Yes, sir. Um, when you're talking about um, before Napoleon kind of wanted to emancipate the Jews, that they created a position, and I don't, I didn't really know what position you were talking about. You said the NGOs or something like that. Yes. What is that? Non-governmental organizations. For example. 
There is an organization in Israel called Yad Sara. When you, uh, you break your leg and it crutches, you can go to Yad Sara and they loan you a pair of crutches. You don't have to pay for it. Later they ask you for a contribution, but that's besides the point. But you don't have to pay for it. How many times did I walk in the streets in New York and I see crutches thrown on the floor? Why? Because apartments are small. They don't want to keep it in their apartment. They know that the health insurance paid for it or didn't pay for it, etc. They use it for three weeks and they throw it. Okay? We have other systems like that. We have system for everything. For example, I'm going to replace this pair of glasses. What am I going to do? Because my numbers changed. What am I going to do with it? I'm giving it to a non-governmental organization because maybe my neighbor wants a pair of glasses and he can't afford them. And you go down the line, there is everything here, everything that you can get from these organizations. Why? Because, let's say Prague, because this is where I saw it. In Prague, uh, the king, because it was a kingdom, didn't give services to the people. Yes, it gave it, the church gave services, not the king. So the church gave services to the people. They got money from the king that the Jews collected for the king. And the church used to maintain its people. Until today, in a few countries in Europe, 2% of your taxes goes to your church in Germany, in Belgium, in Switzerland, 2% of your taxes, go to, you tell them, I belong to this church. So 2% of your taxes go to the church. The Jewish community didn't have that. So they had the mutual assistance. NGOs is non-governmental organizations. spread out throughout the United States, because in the United States you have many of these services. Maybe, luckily, you don't have to use it, but millions and millions and millions of people do have to use it. And that's great. But for us, the Jewish community in Europe wouldn't survive without it. So, what we couldn't survive in the 13th, 12th and 13th centuries, when the societies were formed in the United States, which is a new thing, less than 250 years old, they brought stuff from Europe, they adopted some of the practices in Europe, especially, do you know that you are, that the fact that you speak English is not really a given? You know which were, which were the two languages that were considered? English and Hebrew. The founding fathers of the United States had two options because they were religious and they said, are we going to speak the language of King Charles III that we ousted from here or we're going to speak the language of the Bible, Hebrew. And they decided to make me work <laughs> and decided for English because it was easier. But you could have, just like they spoke in Hebrew, then I would have had a problem speaking to you because then you understand. <laughs> Did I respond? Yes, thank you. You're very Another welcome. Question. I'm so happy when people understood me clearly and they don't want to ask anything. 
<laughs> so thank you very, very much for coming, listening. Thank you very much for being our ambassadors when you go back to the United States. Remember, we represent life. We represent life. Just remember that. We represent the future. We represent advance. We represent whatever we can do. We represent whatever we can do and not whatever we can't. And thank you for being our partners.